Have you ever seen a stereogram? One of those seemingly random repeated pattern, but if you stare at them long enough and in a certain weird way, some images will begin to pop out. You know, for the life of me, I could never see anything. And I hate it because, you know, how come others can see it? How come so many others see, ooh, wow, look at the images coming out. And no matter how hard I try, uh, I just cannot see them. I remember when I was uh, young, when we were young, my younger sister, Reese, she could not say the rolling R, the sound, okay? And uh, no matter how hard she tried, like she would go R, R, R all the time, and she just could not say it. And to think that her name starts with the letter R. You know, when others can do something so common and, and with ease, and we can't, that makes us irritated, isn't it? it? It's so frustrating. And the harder we try, it seems that we just cannot do it. We cannot get it. Do you feel the same way when it comes to God moment? You know, those moments where we have special experiences of God, where we come to know Him and experience Him in a special way. We sometimes tend to think, how come others? It seems like they get to have God moments, like I know, every other hour. But I don't have that many God moments in my life. This morning, we're going to look at a passage that I have seldom heard a message preach on. That's because in a way, this passage is kind of a, kind of blah, you know, it's, it's kind of bland. Luke was just describing how Joseph and Mary took Jesus from Bethlehem to Jerusalem for some Jewish rites. And there in the temple, they met a man named Simeon who took Jesus in his arms and lifted him up. He didn't even ask for permission. Oh my, in our day, he would probably be, su- be, be sued for doing that. And soon after that, another lady, an old lady named Anna came along and they have never met her, but yet somehow she was talking about Jesus as if she had knew him all her life. What's that all about? You know, to be honest with you, it took me quite some time to see the, revel- uh, the, the relevance of this passage because it's, it's like one of those boring entries in, in our journals. You know, today I went to church and attended a service. Mr. So-and-so patted me on the head and said, you know, I'm so big now. It's like he has nothing else to say every time he, met, he meets me. And, I, and then I met Mrs. So-and-so and she kept telling everyone that she knew me even when I was in diapers. And uh, she kept telling everybody all these stories about me in my younger days. It was so embarrassing. And then I came home and that's the end. Now, for most of us, it does seem like an ordinary passage, the passage we're going to look at, describing, you know, an ordinary day. But you know what? For Joseph, Mary, Simeon, and Anna, it was a day filled with amazing God moments. How can such an ordinary day turn into something so extraordinary? That's what we want to see. That's what we want to talk about. The issue I want us to grapple with this morning is that how can I learn, what can I learn here so that I too can experience more God moments, that in my life I can see the extraordinary from the ordinary. I hope that you want to do that also because I know I do. So let's dive right in. Again, the question is how. How can I have more experiences of God? First, from verse 21 to 24 of Luke chapter 2, we see the, what we need to do, first of all, is to live, to live in obedience. Living in obedience. Verse 21 up to 24, it says, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of God, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. If you want to experience God, start here. Start by living in obedience to God. That was exactly what Joseph and Mary, what the two of them were doing. They were careful to obey everything, all the commands of God. Well, let's take a closer look at what they did. First of all, they were they uh, having Jesus circumcised. That's the first thing they did, having Jesus circumcised. They did this on the eighth day. I say, okay, all Jewish boys go through this. 
Secondly, naming him Jesus, or more precisely, Yeshua in Hebrew. Okay, you know, every baby gets a name, nothing special there. Besides, this is just like what uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth did, right? They named the child, the, the very name that the angel Gabriel gave to them. So the same thing, same thing happened here. Thirdly, they were going through purification rites. They were following Leviticus chapter 12. Mary would be unclean after childbirth for 40 days. And then they had to offer a pair of doves or a pair of pigeons. Now, all women who gave birth to sons would have to do the same thing. Okay, it's, it's common. Number four, consecrating Jesus to God. According to Numbers 18, 15 to 16, every firstborn son shall be dedicated, okay, consecrated to God, and they need, and then they needed to be redeemed. Again, everybody does that. Now, some of us would say, wait, there's nothing special here about what Joseph and Mary did, and they were just doing what they were supposed to do. All devout Jews knew all about this, you know, by heart and by their actions. What's so special about that? Well, you're right. There's nothing special about what they did. And that's the point. That's the point. They were doing what they were supposed to do. That's how you put yourself by doing what you're supposed to do. That's how you put yourself on the path of blessing. Obedience places you on the path of blessing. Yes, they were doing what they were expected to do. And that's the point. You know, sometimes... We don't want to do what we're supposed to do. We don't want to do what's expected of us, right? I mean, because of our sinful nature, how often we catch ourselves saying things like, do I really have to do that? Do I have to obey? You know, and, and we just don't want to do it. I'm certain it wasn't easy also for Joseph and Mary to follow through with all the requirements. There were so many of them. The fact that they had to offer two pigeons or two doves shows that they were poor. And so they did not have the means. It was not easy for them to do it, but they did them anyway. Remember, obedience is the mark of faith. When we obey, it shows to others that we are obeying God. And obedience, again, keeps you in the right relationship with God so that the channel of blessings, okay, the, the, the path, we place ourselves on the path of blessings. And we know that God longs to bless us. Of course, we need to note also that by blessings here, it's not necessarily, you know, fabulous wealth or, or extreme comfort because God knows exactly what are blessings for us and what are not blessings for us. And when we say blessings, it's not exactly according to how we see it, but how God sees it. But what is clear is this. When there is disobedience, when we do not obey, then we get cut off from that relationship. We're no longer on this path wherein God can bless us as he would like. Remember Adam and Eve, they did not do what God wanted them to do. They disobeyed, eating the fruit of the knowledge of the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, their experience of God their daily time, you know, if you think about it, that's one of the, the, the most epic God moments ever. Every day they get to be with God, talking with God, walking with God in the garden. They lost that. Why? Because of disobedience. Disobedience keeps us from the path of blessing. A few months ago, we purchased a brand new electric air circulator. Well, that's just a fancy name for an electric fan. And I, I was removing all the packages with a pair of scissors. I was cutting, you know, cutting it open. And then I felt a snap. <laughs> you know what happened? You know what happened? I, I cut the power cord. Yes, I cut the power cord to our brand new electric fan. So now, no matter how nice the fan is, even with the all direction, okay, not just left and right, but up and down, all direction oscillation with the full function remote control with 30, 32 speed powerful motor, all that means nothing if the connection is lost. If, if you are not connected to the power, you're not connected to the source, the electric fan might just as well be a door stopper, a very cumbersome one at that. So even though, it may seem like, hey, I'm, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Well, that's exactly what we need to do. Because that's, it is through obedience that we are placed on the path of blessing. So first of all, if you want to experience more of God moments, 
Well, keep yourself on the path of grace, living in obedience. Secondly, we need to wait and listen with anticipation. We need to expect God to speak to us. And that's the second point, waiting in anticipation. Let's read about Simeon and what he did. Verse 25, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, Joseph and Mary were, again, just doing what they were supposed to do. So I'm sure they, and I'm sure there were other parents there also, right, dedicating their children. But yet out of the blue, here comes Simeon, who just took Jesus in his arms and prophesied about what would happen to Jesus. How did this God moment came about? Coincidence? Maybe a, you know, a good guess by Simeon. Maybe he was taking a chance. Maybe this is it. Maybe he's the one. Well, let's take a closer look at Simeon and see what he had been doing all of his life. Well, the Bible describes for us who was Simeon. He was righteous and devout. Number two, he had been waiting for the Messiah. You know, all his life, he had been waiting for the Messiah. Number three, he had the Holy Spirit on him. Number four, he was in touch with the Holy Spirit. He, he hears the Holy Spirit, and so he's sensitive to him. He obeyed the Holy Spirit as he was moved by the Spirit at just the right time, at the right moment, he went to the temple. And lastly, he knew exactly who the Messiah would be and what he would do exactly. I mean, look at his prophecies. Look at what he said about the Messiah. You see, when you are an expert in something, somehow you're able to see and understand things that others do not see and and others don't get it. Why? Because your antennas are tuned in such a way that you're able to pick up signals that others just would miss because they are not tuned to that frequency. They don't get the signals. They cannot see because they're not looking for it. They don't know what to look for. I had a friend who used to wear a fake hairpiece. Yes, a toupee, we call it, and uh, to cover his bald spot. And uh, somehow, because of that, he's able to tell who else is wearing a toupee, who else is wearing fake hair. And we would all be shocked because, you know, hey, that, that looks so natural. How can you tell? Well, he says he knows. He just knows. He can tell. So how could Simeon have known? Well, very easy. Spiritual sensitivity. Because he was walking and listening and conversing with God all of his life, he just knew. He just knew because he was so sensitive spiritually to all these things. All his life, he was living in anticipation of seeing the Lord's Messiah. And, and, and that's why he, he was so well versed. He became an expert. He knew everything there is to know about the Messiah. In the same way, we are commanded to do the same thing. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Verse 13, very important. While we wait for the blessed hope. There it is. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You see, it's very simple. The principle is we see what we look for. 
we see what we look for. Simeon had been looking for the hope of Israel, the Messiah, all of his life. And that's why he could see. That's why when Jesus was there, immediately he could recognize. We see what we are looking for. When we wait in anticipation for the blessed hope, when we expect God to speak to me today, we're much more likely to hear him, right? You're much more likely to see what God wants you to see when you are waiting, when you are listening with anticipation. You know, it's quite amazing how we can hear our names in a noisy and crowded situation. It's like, you know, if you ever go to a government agency and applying for something, somehow through the noise, you can hear them calling your name. I, I know if you notice that, why? Because I know you've been waiting there for hours, hoping against hope that they would finally call your name. And so you're waiting for them to call your name. Plus, you're very familiar with your name. And that's why when they call your name, you immediately could recognize it. In the same way, we must learn to be expectant, to be attentive to our surrounding and anticipating that God would speak to me. And we could recognize God's presence. We could recognize God's handiwork because we are expecting it. We're looking for it because we see what we look for and we, and we hear what we listen for also. John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. My sheep, you know, I hope we are his sheep. We should listen to his voice so much so that we could recognize him. Furthermore, we realize that Simeon, he was righteous and devout. It means that he has devoted his whole life studying the scriptures and at that time studying the Old Testament and so that he has a very clear understanding. He knows exactly what the Messiah would be. He knows exactly the Messiah who is to come. And you know what, friends? We have something that Simeon did not. We have the complete Bible. That's amazing. We have the inspired word of God to read, to study, to meditate, to learn from, to hear from God. Because that's the main way. The Bible is the main way that God speaks to us. And if you want to experience God, the best way, the main way is through His word, through the Bible. Because that's His word. That's, that's the word of God. And the way we, just like in any relationship, the way we come to know and experience someone it's through communication. It's through talking to that, to that person and listening to him. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when we have questions about a certain topic or a decision that we need to make in our lives, where do we go to? We should go and see what the Bible has to say about it. We hear his voice when we spend time in the Bible, when we spend quiet time in the anticipation and we reflect, okay, we contemplate upon his word, then he can speak to us and we can hear him. When we become sensitive, when we spend time in intimate relationship, we spend quiet time with him. And by that, it will be easier and easier for us to recognize his voice and his leading in our lives. So are you expecting him to speak to you today? Well, waiting in anticipation is the second thing we need to have so that we can have more God moments. Thirdly, serving with passion. How do you have more God moments? Serve with passion. Verse 36 to 38. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, we're not very sure who Anna the prophetess is. Now, these three verses are all we have, okay? All the information we have on her. Well, but even in these three verses, we can learn a lot about her. First of all, she was widowed at a very young age. 
uh, girls back then, they get married usually around 13, 14, or sometimes 12, 12 to 15. And so if she got married at 13 years old, seven years later, at 20 years old, she became a widow. Wow, very young, very young. And there's no mention here of her having children. And so she probably did not have any children. So life must have been very difficult for her. And now she is very old. Okay, verse 37 is translated now that she's 84. But it can also be translated, if you look at the footnote, it can also be translated that she had been a widow now for 84 years. Now, I think the second translation seems to make more sense because the Bible says she is very old. And if she became a widow at 20, and she had been a widow for 84 years. So she's like, I don't know, 104, 105. Now that's old, okay? That's old. Now we would expect a woman who has gone through so much pain and hardship to end up to become, you know, when, when they get to be so old, you know, to be old and grumpy, resentful, angry, sullen, and probably a loner who doesn't want to talk to anybody and don't want anyone to bother them at all. But to our surprise, you know, Anna here is the total opposite. In fact, she's probably the best old lady in the entire Bible. Okay, probably. I think if she were in our women's fellowship, she would probably would she probably would have gotten several awards by now. Let's see. Now, first of all, she's old but mobile. You know, she can walk by herself. She's articulate. She can talk and she knows she's very alert, spiritually savvy, and very valuable to the community of believers, all those in the, in the temple. Number two, she worships night and day, meaning, you know, she, and she was fasting and praying. That was her full-time job. And lastly, we see that she was hardworking. She was a workaholic. 24-7, she never left the temple, meaning she was fully dedicated to the Lord. Basically, she's always there. She's always in the temple, fully dedicated to the Lord, never left the temple. And so we see that she is there in the temple, enjoying the, the community of believers, all those who are worshiping God also there. And fasting and praying were her full-time job. Okay, She was doing that full-time. And at just the right moment, she came up to Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus, now, is that a coincidence that it's just at the right time, at the right place? Well, it's another God moment indeed. Imagine Anna experienced that, experienced this amazing God moment that, that she was able to meet baby Jesus at just the right time because she was actively and passionately serving. Active service places her in the right spot. Because, you know, if she had become an old lady, you know, old and grumpy, just sitting around in the house and gossiping about everyone else or, or just waiting for others to serve her, instead, no, she was not like that. She was actively serving others. She was an amazing woman. If she were home griping about others, you know, that day she would have missed it. She would have missed the opportunity. And so I want no one to say I'm too old to serve. No one should ever say that. Anyone here over 105 years old? Can you please raise your hand if you're over 105 years old? If you can still raise your hand, that is. Well, that means, okay, if you're not as old as Anna, it means that you can still serve, just like Anna did. You can say, well, but pastor, you know, I'm, what, what can I do? What did Anna do? What did, what did she do? She fasted and she prayed. That's what we can do also. We can serve others. And take note, this is amazing. I think Anna was also serving in a community of believers because she's always there. Now, it says that she has been praying and fasting all of her life, all the time there. What was she praying about? Okay, think about that. Of course, I, I, she was praying for herself. She was praying for the coming of the Messiah. I'm sure of that. But, you know, what, what else could she have prayed for? You know, all that time, I think she was also praying for others. Those who have come to the temple, those who had uh, prayer needs, she was praying for them. And so in the midst of all of this, in the midst of actively and passionately serving the Lord, God had given her a God-ordained, God-appointed moment that she was able to have this amazing God moment. And just like Simeon, 
Anna knew exactly who Jesus is, you know, she, and, and because of that, she was able to t tell everybody. She was able to, to witness for Jesus because she knew who the Messiah is going to be. So here again, we see the importance of serving actively and also of the importance of having a community of believers. So this morning we see there's something about Joseph, Mary, Simeon, and Anna. All of them had something in common. And that is the fact that they're all common. Okay, they're all common people. There's nothing special about them. And yet they were able to experience God in such amazing and powerful ways. In the same way, you and I, we are common. We're ordinary, ordinary people. But we have an extraordinary God who longs to speak and communicate with us. He wants us to experience Him. He wants us to have God moments. So how do we do that? Well, you don't have to be able to see anything in the stereograms to experience God moments. Thank God for that. Instead, what we need to do is we need to be living in obedience. We need to be waiting in anticipation, okay, expectant heart, and then serving with passion. Do not stop serving the Lord. And my prayer is that all of us will have extraordinary day today as we seek the Lord and to experience Him every day of our lives. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for you are a great, big, amazing, powerful God. And not only that, but you long to have communication with us. You long to speak to us and you long to hear us communicating with you. This is so amazing, Lord. And through the story of the, the dedication of Jesus in the temple and through what Simeon experienced and what Anna experienced and also Joseph and Mary as they were obediently following you, we too, Lord, want to experience this. We too want to have God moments every day, every moment of every day. May we continue to live in obedience so that we are placed in the path of blessings. May we continue to wait in anticipation, knowing that you can speak and you do speak to us. Are we listening? That's the issue. And continue to serve you with passion. Help us not to become complacent, not to become lazy, but to all the more serve you fervently and serve you in the community so that together we can experience you more and more each day so that we too can have powerful God moments in our lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for coming for us. Thank you for speaking to us. May we continue to hear from you every day. This is our prayer. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen.